Jesus left his home in heaven and came to earth to die. In the garden he prayed, Father, not my will but thine. He gave his life a sacrifice that you and I might live. He gave until there was no more he could give. He was willing to pray the price in full. He was willing. die on the cross. He was willing his father to obey. He was willing to wash my sins away. He was willing to yield whatever the Christ is asking you today to give to him your all. He wants to see your life surrendered to his call. Christian, will you die to self? He died. to give. Are you willing to pay the price in full? Are you willing to give to Christ your all? Are you willing to take and carry your cross? Are you Whatever the cost, are you willing for surrender of everything is the only way that a living sacrifice can on the altar Appreciate that. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bible this morning to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. In just a, a moment, we'll begin reading in verse number 1, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And I just want to say thank you to you as a church. We appreciate all your prayers and your support uh, for us and being behind us. As uh, and we'll report a little more on it tonight, but we had uh, spent the year in Costa Rica from April until mid to the end of this past April, so one year in the language school studying Spanish. 
And uh, we're thankful to have the opportunity to come back. Pastor Bowman, I appreciate the invitation to come and to speak and to share with you folks. And it's always good to get to come and see family and uh, to meet new folks that are in the church here as well. And uh, uh, last time I was here, uh, other than just a, a brief visit, um, your, your previous pastor was a pastor, and so it's, it's exciting to get to see uh, Brother Bowman now as the pastor and to see what the Lord's done in their lives and, and how he's grown and uh, see how the Lord's blessing the church. Uh, just a moment, we'll begin reading in verse number 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. But before we, we read, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray and ask Him to bless this time together. Father, we're so thankful for your blessings, and we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to meet together today in your house, and for this opportunity to study your word. And I just come to you this morning, and I pray that you would be with me, that you would fill me with your spirit, and that you'd give me clarity of thought, clarity of speech, to say and to share the things that you've laid on my heart. I pray that this would be a blessing and a help and an encouragement to your children that are here today. If there's anyone here today that does not know you as their Savior, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that they would realize your love, your desire for them to be saved. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin reading in verse number 1, I want to stop just periodically as we read through and make a couple comments as we get down to our, our focus verse this morning. But in verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now just to pause there for a moment and, and to, to look at the last part of verse 3 as he says that you charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That phrase is the theme of 1 Timothy. That is the purpose of this book as Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, I left you there that you would charge these, these people, these men, these pastors or preachers, charge them or exhort them, as another word for command them, you could say, that they teach no other doctrine, that they stop this uh, giving heed or teaching, spending time on these fables and endless genealogies. Now, that's, there's so many things in the Bible that I find hard to understand. I don't understand why a preacher would want to preach on the genealogies in the Bible. I always find that hard to, to study myself. All those names that are they're, they're difficult for a southern uh, boy from the hills like me to pronounce. But I, I understand that part of the reason that they would teach these genealogies really was to puff themselves up. Kind of as, as Paul uh, did in, in the book of Philippians, and he wasn't puffing himself up, or I believe it was in Corinthians actually, where he was showing to them that he was of the tribe of Benjamin from Abraham and all these things, just showing them as he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, it seems to me that part of, of what was going on, these men were teaching, the Bible calls them fables. And he says that they teach no other doctrine. Now, we have our doctrine. We have what we are to preach. But I'll be honest, sometimes as preachers, it's easy to get off onto other issues. And, and some of those may not be bad issues. Some of them might be things that need to be addressed from time to time. But Paul writes to Timothy and he exhorts them that, that they teach no other doctrine, they, that they just stop uh, with these endless genealogies. He said that they um, minister questions rather than godly edifying. When the Word of God is preached 
and taught, it ought to help us. It ought to strengthen us, and often it ought to reprove us. It shouldn't leave us, have us leaving church going, I wonder what in the world that meant. I don't understand that. I can't find that in the Bible, or, or, or what does this mean? It needs to, uh, to minister godly edifying. But now as we look into verse number 5, the Bible says this, as Paul continues, he's continuing with this thought. He says, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved, these are these teachers, these these men that he speaks of, some have swerved, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain janglings. I think of the sound of keys jangling, or I think the idea is maybe bells or cymbals or, or, or uh, chimes. They're just empty sounds. And he says they're preaching, they're teaching as they go about these fables, these endless genealogies, these... Uh, other places in the Bible uses the words questions and strifes about the law as they go on debating these things. Paul says it's nothing more than vain janglings. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And before we continue reading, I want to point out something in verse number 5. The Bible says, and I love this phrase, the Bible says, now the end of of the commandment is charity. I remember one time, I don't remember if I read it in a commentary or if I, maybe I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance. I can't remember exactly how, but I just looked up that word end. Now, I know the word end. We all understand what end is, but I was surprised to, to learn that in, in this passage, the sense of that word means the completion or the, the purpose the fulfillment of. When, when you do something, you have an end in mind. Did you understand what I'm saying? You could say, God's purpose for the law, the end of the commandment, or the, the result, the target that God is aiming at for the commandment, what does it say? The end of the commandment is charity. And I thought, wow. God's purpose for this book is to produce love in our hearts. And I realize that if, when, when I read the Word of God, it should be my desire that love is produced in my heart. Love for the Lord, love for the brethren, and love for the lost. As I read God's Word, that should be produced in my life. That is God's purpose for His Word. And as we preach the Word of God, we ought to see love grow as a result of the preaching of God's Word. And as I put that together with the context, I realize that as these guys are preaching all these other things that they find to be important, the result was not love. It was not godly edifying. It was probably strife. It was probably divisions within the church. There was probably a group over here saying, I'm of Paul, and a group over here saying, I'm of Apollos. And you, you see the result of those things. But God's purpose for the Word was that it produced love in our hearts. And moving on to verse number 8, the Bible says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. We see the other purpose of God's law is to show us our sin. The word of God was written for sinners. And hopefully this morning you can put yourself in that boat and say, well, I'm a sinner. The Word of God is for me as well. That's his, his desire for his Word. 
looking down, I believe we were in verse number 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. That was Paul. Paul said, before my salvation, this is who I was. I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Here's the phrase I want to focus on this morning. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. There's a lot that we've read in that passage this morning, but as I said, I believe that the the purpose of this book is as he writes that, that you charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And as I read through it, it feels to me as if Paul, it, he's exhorting Timothy about these things, as they, they realize what the purpose of the Word of God is. It's to produce love. It's to show us our sin and stay away from all these other doctrines, these fables, these endless genealogies. And it seems to me that it comes to a... a what's the word, a zenith, a pinnacle, as he comes to this verse and he says, hey, this is worthy of all acceptation. Timothy, this is what you need to preach. This is what needs to be taken around the world that Christ Jesus came to save. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There's three reasons that, that come to my mind why anyone can be saved. Number one, anyone can be saved because His grace is exceeding abundant. It, you know, it's almost as if all those words are unnecessary. Abundant is enough. Exceeding is enough. But the Bible says His grace is exceeding abundant. It's so much more than we ever need that it, it's, it's exceeding much more than what we ever need. His grace is exceeding abundant to save any sinner. Verse 14 says that very thing, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. Romans 5 verse 20 says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. As deep as the waters of sin increased, his grace increased even more. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The second reason why I believe anyone can be saved is because God saved the chief sinner to prove that he can save you as well. That's what Paul writes in verse 15 and 16. He says, of whom I am chief. Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And Paul goes on to say that he saved him first to uh, show forth all long suffering as a pattern to them that could come after. So that anyone can look into the Bible and say, well, hey, he saved Paul. I guess he can save me as well. He saved the chief sinner to prove that he can save us. And the third reason why anyone can be saved is this. Because Jesus came to save you. Anyone can be saved because of the fact that Christ came to save you. It is great news to say that you can be saved. That's wonderful enough, but what is even better than that is to not only say that you can be saved, but to say that Christ came to save you. One is to say, well, it's a possibility. You, you can be saved. But the other is to say it is a priority. He came to save you. One, it, it gives the idea to say, well, you, could, you can be saved. That kind of might give some the idea to say, well, boy, I, I could be saved. I sure hope it works out for me. Uh, it kind of gives the idea that you've got to come to Christ 
and, and maybe you've got to find him and you've got to seek for him and you've got to plead with him and, and maybe even beg him and, and it kind of gives you the idea that the Lord says, well, all right, I guess I'll save you. You've asked me enough. I guess I'll go ahead and save you too. That's the wrong idea. It's not that you can be saved, but he came to save you with that specific purpose in mind. It's not we who are doing the begging. It is he that is doing the begging. He comes to us and he pleads with us. So one idea is to say, well, boy, I, I hope I can convince the Lord to save me. I hope I can do enough good that God will save me. And the other says, no, it has nothing to do with us. It's all about him. He came seeking you. You can be saved because that is why he came. He came seeking you to save you. One says it's possible, but you have to find it. The other says he specifically came for you. I've heard people say things like this. They say, I found Jesus. Or speaking of someone else, if somebody begins to attend church, others will say, well, he found, he found Jesus or he found religion. We've heard people say that. And I understand what they mean, but the truth is that that's really not a true statement. It's not that we found him, it's that he found us. He wasn't lost. He didn't need anyone to seek him. We were lost and he found us. He came seeking after us. He sought us and found us and died for us and he wants to redeem us unto himself. And you don't have to turn there this morning, but in the Gospel of Luke, verse 10, the Bible says, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is his purpose. I will have you, if you will, please turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15, and verse number 1. Luke chapter 15, verse number 1, the Bible says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured and said, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And after that verse, I say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's received us. Not only has he received us, he eats with us. He communes with us. He has a relationship with us. The Pharisees and scribes murmured and said, he's receiving sinners. Verse 3, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. These scribes and Pharisees, they said, Hey, hold on a second, won't you look at that? He sat down to eat, and he's going to let these, these sinners, these publicans, sit down and eat with them. And it's almost as if Jesus says, hold on a second here. You, you fellas don't understand. It's not that I just sat down, and they happened to come over, and I decided to go ahead and let them sit down. But actually, I came here seeking them. Amen. They didn't come here just seeking to sit with me, and I permit it to happen I came here for the very purpose of seeking them. You didn't just come here this morning and find that God was in a good mood and he decided to let you come to church. No, you come here this morning and found out that he has been seeking you this entire time. He's been desiring to bring you to himself. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while... We were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Even though we were sinners, after all of our sin, after all of our filth, all of our wickedness, our rejection of Him, after all of our rebellion against Him, after the mess of our own making, He still 
came to save us. And He came seeking to save us. It's His desire to save the lost. Do you know that there's three things that Jesus has never seen? Did you know that? Think of that. There's three things that Jesus has never seen. Number one, he's never seen a man or a woman who has not sinned. He's never seen that. Number two, he has never seen a sinner that he did not love. And number three, he has never seen a sinner that he could not save. Three things that Jesus has never seen. He's never seen a sinner that he could not save simply because our salvation is not based on our righteousness. It's based on his righteousness. So it doesn't matter what the sinner has done, where they've been. It's not based on his righteousness. It's based, or that sinner's righteousness or ours. It's based on the righteousness of Jesus. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 clearly says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I'm just going to briefly read uh, one or two verses out of Romans chapter 3. You don't have to turn there for time's sake this morning, but I would encourage you sometime on your own to read this passage for yourself, the whole passage. But in, in verse 25, speaking of, of Jesus, the Bible says, "...whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation..." Through faith in His blood, that word propitiation is a, a big word. That simply means, if you've never understood that word, a propitiation is something that satisfies. Jesus is the one who has satisfied the holiness of God. So that you could be, it's not the works you do. It's not the good things you do. It's not how you cleaned up yourself. It's not all the Bible you read or all the good things you do. It's what Jesus did that, that satisfies God the Father. But it goes on to say, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. Verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. Do you see, anyone can be saved because it's not the righteousness of this person or the sins of this person or the good deeds of this person. It's based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The very best that we have in the eyes of the Lord are as filthy as filthy rags. So it certainly can't be based on our righteousness. I always enjoyed reading the story, in, uh, and we'll just briefly describe the story this morning in Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, Zechariah had a vision of uh, Joshua the high priest. And in this vision, he sees Joshua standing before the Lord. And you've probably read this passage yourselves. And the Bible says he was standing before the Lord clothed in filthy raiment. And, and those rags represented his iniquities, our sins. But we see even our righteousnesses as filthy rags. But then God says, take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Amen. Joshua didn't clothe himself. God clothed him, and he put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on him. It's uh, getting off topic just a little bit, but I always love this story. As we've traveled through the United States back and forth so much, I have... Uh, <clears throat> the audio stories of the Chronicles of Narnia. Anyone ever listened to or read the Chronicles of Narnia? They're exciting, and to me, I enjoy listening to them. I find them exciting. If it's getting late at night and I'm feeling sleepy, I'd put earphones in. And uh, just the other day, we were listening to it again as we were driving from Oklahoma over to Alabama to be with you folks. And there's one passage, there's one story where there's a boy named Eustace, and, and he, he was 
a bit of a brat is really the best way to describe him. But he had gotten into, and all of this is a make-believe story, of course. It's an allegory of, of kind of the Christian life in a way. And he had gotten into a treasure of a, from a dragon, and he was turned into a dragon himself. And it was just a, a bad story, all that he went through. But at the end, he finally met Aslan. And Aslan, of course, pictures for us the Savior. And, and Eustace was trying to get the dragon scales off himself. And finally, Aslan did it for him. Because, you see, we can't remove our own iniquity. But what I really like, and in the story, it goes so fast you almost don't catch it, but he was describing later what had happened, and, and the, the story says that, that uh, Aslan took the dragon scales off of him and dressed him himself, and it said, and Eustace never quite could explain how the lion dressed him, and I thought, you know, I heard that, and, and I just got chills, I thought, boy, what a wonderful picture of how the Savior clothes us in his righteousness. And here in this story, this boy described how he took the dragon scales off of him and he said, but he never could quite explain how the lion dressed him. He dressed him in his own garments that he had provided for him. And for us as Christians, that's what the Lord does for us. He takes off our, our filth, our iniquities, even our self-righteousness, and he clothes us in the garments that he has provided, in the garments of his own salvation, his own righteousness. So, yes, anyone can be saved. There's never been a Savior he could not save because it's based on his righteousness, not ours, and because he came to save you. A third thing to think about this morning before we're out of time is this. Jesus did not come to condemn. He came to save. We won't turn there because I know most of you can probably quote this passage with me. As we traveled through the United States, our, our boys and, and Valerie, they learned how to quote John chapter 3, I believe it was verses 14 all the way down to 19. But as they would quote John 3.16, one day it occurred to me that I had that verse memorized and I never quite paid attention because I had it in memory. And then I was kind of tuned out at verse number 17. Have you ever done that yourselves? Well, just listen to the verse, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And one day I was listening to the kids quote that verse, and I'd been in churches and, and heard them quote it so many times, and then one day it just dawned on me. God did not send Jesus to condemn, he sent him to save. But there's no telling how many people there are in the world that have bought into Satan's lie that God is seeking to condemn them. They're a sinner, they've done wrong, and if we're all honest, we've all felt that way before, right? But God did not send Jesus to condemn, he sent him to save. My mind goes back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had first sinned, what did they do? They ran and hid themselves. They hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden when they heard the Lord come in the, in the cool of the evening. Why did they hide themselves? Because they said to themselves in their mind, they said, certainly he has come to condemn us. But what did the Lord come to the garden for? Did he come to condemn them? No, he came to restore them. Now, he did have to deal with their sin. And the Lord does have to deal with our sin. And Christ dealt with our sins on the cross of Calvary. But we need to understand that he came not to condemn, but to save them. And today, Christ Jesus came to save sinners. That's his purpose. Think of all that Christ accomplished on this earth. What did he accomplish? He preached 
the greatest messages ever preached in Sunday school. We heard Pastor Bowman uh, teach on part of the Beatitudes. Christ preached the greatest messages ever preached. He fulfilled righteousness. He defeated Satan. He led captivity captive. He fulfilled the prophecies. He per performed many wonderful miracles. He healed the sick. He healed the deaf, the lame, the blind. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He calmed the storms. He fed the multitudes. But of all the things that he did, these things were not his purpose for coming to the earth. Of all those things that he did, his only single purpose was to save sinners. And of all those great things that he did, if he had not saved sinners, they would have all been a failure. And as we think of missions today, there's a lot of great things going on in the name of missions. And I'm not against them. I'm not against feeding the hungry or, or having uh, children's homes and so many things. But if we do all of those things and we fail to reach the lost, everything that we do is a failure. The greatest purpose and priority of Jesus Christ is to save the lost. And if that is the case, then no other purpose could be greater for your life and for my life. If the purpose of Jesus Christ was to reach the lost, then nothing could be a greater purpose for me and for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, just listen to the verse this morning. The Bible says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He has now passed that baton off to you and to me. The Bible says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. The world cannot reconcile itself. God had to reconcile the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us. He has put in our hands, our trust, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now we stand in His stead. We're there to say to the world, be reconciled to God. The purpose of Jesus Christ is to seek and to save. Christ Jesus came to save. The last verse that we'll close with this morning is this verse. John chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Why was he sent? Why did he come? He came to save. And as he was sent, so has he sent us.